So this is Game Theory Economics 159. If you're here for art history, you're either in the wrong room or stay anyway. Maybe this is the right room, but this is Game Theory, okay? Uh, you should have four handouts. Everyone should have four handouts. There is a legal release form, we'll talk about it in a minute, uh, about the videoing. There is a syllabus, which is a preliminary syllabus, it's also online, and there are two games labeled Game 1 and Game 2. Can I get you all to look at Game 1 and start thinking about it? And while you're thinking about it, I'm hoping you can multitask a bit. I'll describe a bit about the class and we'll get a bit of admin under our belts. But please try and look at, if somebody's not looking at it because they're using it as a fan here, so, right, so you look, look at Game 1 and fill out that form for me, okay? So while you're filling that out, let me tell you a little bit what, what we're going to be doing here. So what, what is game theory? Game theory is a method of studying strategic situations. Okay, so what's a strategic situation? Well, let's start off with what's not a strategic, strategic situation. In your economics, in your intro economics class in 115 or 110, you saw some pretty good examples of situations that were not strategic. You saw firms working in perfect competition. Right? Firms in perfect competition are price takers. They don't particularly have to worry about the actions of their competitors. Right? You also saw firms that were monopolists. And monopolists don't have any competitors to worry about, so that's not a particularly strategic situation. They're not price takers, but they take the demand curve. Right? Is this looking familiar for some of you who can remember doing 115 last year or maybe two years ago for some of you? All right? Everything in between is strategic. So everything that constitutes imperfect competition is a, is a strategic setting. Think about the motor industry, the motor car industry. Ford has to worry about what GM is doing and what Toyota is doing. And for, for the moment, at least, what Chrysler is doing, but perhaps not for long. All right? All right? So there's a small number of firms, their actions affect each other. All right? So for a literal definition of what strategic means, it's a setting where the outcomes that, that affect you depend on actions, not just on your own actions, but on actions of others. All right, that's as much as I'm going to say for preview right now. We're going to come back and see plenty of this over the course of the next semester. So what I want to do is get on and talk about where, you know, where this applies. So obviously, it applies in economics, but it also applies in politics. And in fact, this class will count as a political science class if you're a political science major. You should go, go check with the DUS in political science. Right? It count, it, uh, uh, game theory is uh, very important in law these days. So for those of you, for the half of you who are going to end up in law school, this is pretty good training. Game theory is also used in biology, and towards the middle of the semester, we're actually going to see some examples of game theory as applied to evolution. And not surprisingly, game theory is, uh, applies to sport. All right? So let's talk about a bit, a bit of admin. How are you doing on filling out those games? Everyone managing to multitask, filling in game one? Keep writing. I want to get some admin out of the way, and I want to start by getting out of the way what is obviously the elephant in the room. Some of you will have noticed that there's a camera crew here. Okay, so uh, as you, some of you probably know, uh, Yale is uh, undergoing a, 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 an open education project and they're videoing several classes and the idea of this is to make educational materials available beyond the walls of Yale. Uh, in fact, on the web internationally. So people in places, maybe places in the US or places miles away, maybe in, in, in Timbuktu or whatever, who find it difficult to get ed uh, educational materials uh, uh, from a local university or whatever, can watch certain lectures from Yale on the web. Right? Some of you would have been in classes that do that before. What's going to be different about this class is that you're going to be participating in it. Right? The way we teach this class is we're going to play games, we're going to have discussions, we're going to talk among, among the class, and you're going to be learning from each other. Right? And I want you to help people watching at home to be able to learn too. And that means you're going to be on film, at very least on mic. All right, so how's that going to work? Uh, around the room are three TAs holding mics. Let me show you where they are. One here, one here, and one here. When I ask the classroom discussions, I'm going to have one of the TAs go to you with a microphone, uh, much like in you know, Donahue or something. Okay? All right? And at certain times, you're going to be seen on film. So the camera is actually going to come around and point in your direction. Now, I really want this to happen. I had to argue for this to happen, because I really feel that this class isn't about me. I'm, you know, I'm part of the class, obviously, but it's about you teaching each other and, and participating. All right? But there's a catch. The catch is that that means you have to sign that legal release form. So you'll see that you have in front of you a legal release form. You have to, be able to sign it. And what that says is that we can use you being uh, shown in class. Think of this as a bad hair day release form. 
right? You can't sue Yale later if you had a bad hair day, right? For those of you who are on the run from the FBI, your visas run out, or you're sitting next to your ex-girlfriend, uh, you know, now would be a good time to put a paper bag over your head. <laughs> All right. Now, just to get you used to the idea, uh, in every class, we're going to have, uh, I think, the same two people. So Jude is the cameraman. When you all wave to Jude, this is Jude, right? Yeah, right, right, okay, okay. And Wes is our audio guy. This is Wes, right? And I will try and remember not to include Jude and Wes in the classroom discussions, but you should be aware that they're there, all right? Now, if this is making you nervous, if it's any consolation, it's making me very nervous, okay? So, all right, we'll try and make this class work as smoothly as we can, allowing for this extra thing. And let me just say, no one's making any money off this. At least I, I'm hoping these guys are being paid, but me and the TAs are not being paid. This is a, uh, the aim of this is, I think, is a good aim. It's an educational project, and I'm hoping you'll help us with it. All right? The one difference it is going to mean is that at times, I might hold some of the discussions for the class coming down into this part of the, uh, uh, of the, of the room here to make it a little easier uh, for Jude. All right, how are we doing now on filling out those forms? Has everyone filled in their strategy for the first game? Not yet. Okay, so let's go on doing a bit more admin. The thing you mostly care about, I'm guessing, is the grades. All right, so how is the grade going to work for this class? 30% of the class will be on problem sets, 30% of the grade, 30% on the midterm, and 40% on the final, so 30, 30, 40. The midterm will be held in class on October 17th. That is also on your syllabus. Don't, please don't anybody tell me late, you know, any time after today you didn't know when the midterm was and therefore you've cl it clashes with 17 different things. The midterm is on October 17th, which is a Wednesday, in class. All right. The problem sets. There will be uh, roughly 10 problem sets, and I'll talk about them more later on when I hand them out. The first one will go out uh, on Monday, but it will be due uh, 10 days later. Roughly speaking, they'll be every week. The grade distribution. All right, so this is the rough grade distribution. Roughly speaking, uh, a sixth of the class are going to end up with A's, a sixth are going to end up with A minus, a sixth are going to end up with B plus, a sixth are going to end up with B, a sixth are going to end up with B minus, and the remaining sixth, if I added that up right, are going to end up with what I guess we're now calling the presidential grade. Is that right? <laughs> right? That's not literally true. I'm going to squeeze it a bit. I'm going to curve it a bit. So actually, a slightly fewer than a sixth will get straight A's, and fewer than a sixth will get uh, you know, C's and below, uh, will squeeze the middle to make, the, to make them be more B's. Uh, one thing I can guarantee from past experience in this class is that the median grade will be a B plus. Right? The median will hit, fall somewhere in the B pluses. All right? Now just as forewarning for people who've forgotten what a median is, that means half of you, not, not approximately half, I mean exactly half of you, will be getting B, something like B plus and below, and half will be getting something like B plus and above. Okay. Now, how are you doing in filling in the forms? Everyone filled it in yet? Surely must be pretty close to getting everyone filled in. All right. So, uh, last things to talk about before I actually collect them in. Textbooks. There are textbooks for this class. The main textbook is this one, Dutter's book, Strategy and Games. If you want a slightly tougher book, more rigorous book, try Joel Watson's book, Strategies. Both of those books are available at the bookstore. Right? But I want to warn everybody ahead of time, I will not be following the textbook. I regard these books as safety nets. If you don't understand something that happened in class, you want to reinforce an idea that came up in class, then you should read the relevant chapters in the book, and the syllabus will tell you which chapters to read for each class, or for each week of the class. Right? But I will, I will not be following these books religiously at all. In fact, uh, they're just there as backup. In addition, I strongly recommend people read Thinking Strategically. This is a good bedtime reading. Do any of you suffer from insomnia? It's very good bedtime reading if you suffer from insomnia. <laughs> there's, it's a good book, and what's more, there's going to be a new edition of this book this year, and Norton have allowed us to get advanced copies of it. So if you don't buy this book this week, uh, I may be able to make the advanced copy of the new edition available for some of you next week. Uh, I'm not taking a cut of that either, right? There's no, there's no money changing hands there. All right, sections are on the syllabus, sign up, uh, sorry, on the website, sign up as usual. Put yourself down on the wait list if you don't get into the section you want. You probably will get into the section you want once we're done. All right, now we must be done with the forms. Are we done with the forms? All right, so why don't we send the TAs, with or without mics, up and down the aisles and collect in your game number one. Not, not game number two, just game number one.
just while we're doing that, I think the reputation of this class, I think, if you look at the course evaluations online or whatever, is that this class is reasonably hard but reasonably fun. All right? So I, that, that, I, I'm hoping that's what the reputation of the class is. All right? So you shouldn't, if you think this class is going to be easy, I think it isn't actually an easy class. It's actually quite a card class. But I think I can guarantee it's going to be a fun class. Now, one reason it's a fun class is the nice thing about teaching game theory, quieten down, folks. The nice thing about teaching game theory is you get to play games. And that's exactly what we've just been doing now. This is our first game, and we're going to play games throughout the course, sometimes several times a week, sometimes just once a week. We got all these things in? Everyone hand them in? So I need to get those counted. Has anyone taken the Yale accounting class? No one, wants to, no one has aspirations to be at one person has? I'll, I'll have a TA do it. It's all right. I'll have a TA do it. So uh, Kai, can you count those for me? Is that right? Let me read out the game you've just played. Game one, a simple grade scheme for the class. Read the following carefully without showing your neighbor what you are doing. Put in the box below either the letter alpha or the letter beta. Think of this as a grade bid. I will randomly pair your form with another form, and neither you nor your pair will ever know with whom you were paired. Here's how the grades may be assigned for the class. Well, they won't be, but we can pretend. If you put alpha and your pair puts beta, then you will get an A and your pair a C. If you and your pair both put alpha, you'll both get B minus. If you put beta and your pair puts alpha, you'll get a C and your pair an, uh, an A. And if you and your pair both put beta, then you'll both get B plus. All right, so that's the thing you just filled in. Now, before we talk about this, let's just collect this information in a more useful way. So I'm going to remove this for now. All right, we'll discuss this in a second. But why don't we actually record what, what the game is that we're playing first? So this is our grade game. And what I'm going to do, since it's kind of hard to absorb all the information just by reading a paragraph of text, I'm going to make a table to record the information. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put me here and my pair, the person I'm randomly paired with here, and alpha and beta, which are the choices I'm going to make here, and in the columns, alpha and beta, the choices my pair is making. And in this table, I'm going to put my grades. All right, so my grades, if, I, if we both put alpha, is B minus. If we both put beta, was B plus. If I put alpha and she put a beta, I got an A. And if I put beta and she put an alpha, I got a C. Is that correct? That's more or less right? Yeah? OK, while we're here, why don't we do the same for my pair? All right, so this is my grades on the left-hand table. But now, let's look at what my pair will do, what my pair will get. So I should warn people sitting at the back that my handwriting is pretty bad. That's one reason for moving forward. The other thing I should apologize for this st at this stage of the class is my accent. I will try and improve the handwriting. There's not much I can do about the accent at this stage. All right, so once again, if we both put alpha, then my pair gets a B minus. If we both put beta, then we both get a B plus. So in particular, my pair gets a B plus. If I put alpha and my pair puts beta, then she gets a C. And if I put beta and she puts alpha, then she gets an A. All right, so I now have all the information that was on the sheet of paper that you just handed in. All right. Now, there's another way of organizing this that's standard in game theory, so we may as well get used to it now on the first day. Rather than drawing two different tables like this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the second table and superimpose it on top of the first table. OK, so let me do that, and you'll see what I mean. What I'm going to do is draw a larger table, the same basic structure. I'm choosing alpha and beta on the rows. My pair is choosing alpha and beta on the columns. But now I'm going to put both grades in. So the easy ones are on the diagonal. We both get B minus if we both choose alpha. 
we both get B plus if we both choose beta. Right? But if I choose alpha and my pair chooses beta, I get an A and she gets a C. And if I choose beta and she chooses alpha, then it's me who gets the C and it's her who gets the A. All right? So notice what I did here. The first grade corresponds to the row player, me in this case, and the second grade in each box corresponds to the column player, my pair in this case. So this is a nice succinct way of recording what was in the previous two tables. Right? And this is an outcome matrix. This tells us everything that was in the game. It's an outcome matrix. All right? OK. So now seems a good time to start talking about what people did. So uh, let's just have a show of hands. How many of you uh, chose alpha? Right, leave your hands up so that Jude can catch that, so, just so people can see at home, OK? All right? And how many of you chose beta? That's right, far more out. And keep the beaters, wave your hands to beaters, OK? All right, there's a beta here, OK? So a lot, it looks like a lot of, well, we're going to find out, we're going to count, but a lot more alphas than betas. Let me try and find out some reasons why people chose. So let me have the alphas up again. Uh, so uh, the, the, the woman who's in red here, uh, can we get a mic to the, yeah, is it, is it okay we ask you? Are you, you're not on the run from the FBI, we can ask you why, why you, okay. So you chose alpha, right? So why did you choose alpha? So, so you wrote out these squares, you realized what your partner was going to do, and responded to that. Any other reasons for choosing alpha around the room? Can we get the, the, the woman in here? Try not to be uh, intimidated by these microphones. They're just mics. Uh, it's okay. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's weird that alpha, um, regardless of what my partner chose, I think there would be better um, outcomes than choosing. Better. All right. So, so uh, let me see the names a second. So your name was? Courtney. Courtney, and your name was? Clara Lise. So slightly different reasons, same choice, alpha. Clara Lise's reason, what did Clara Lise say? She said, no matter what the other person does, she reckons she'd get a, get a better grade if she chose alpha. So hold that thought a second. We'll come back to, is it Clara, Clara Lise? Is that right? We'll come back to Clara Lise in a second. Let's talk to the beaters a second. Let me just emphasize at this stage, there are no wrong answers. Later on in the class, there'll be some questions which have wrong answers. Right now, there's no wrong answers. All right, there may be bad reasons, but there's no wrong answers. So let's have the beaters up again. Let's, let's see the beaters. Oh, come on. There was a beta right here. You were, you were a beta, right? Uh, you've backed off the beta. OK. Uh, so how can I get a mic into a beta? Let's, let's stick in this aisle a bit. Is that a beta right there? Are you, are you a beta right there? Or there, was, there was a, can, can I get the beta in here? Who is the beta in here? Can we, get a, can we get the mic in there? Is that possible? In here? Can you leave your hand up? So yeah, there we go. There we go. Just point towards it. That's fine. That's fine. Just, 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 just speak into it. That's fine. So the reason, right? Yeah, go ahead. I personally don't like swings that much, and it's the B minus B plus range, so I'd much rather pr uh, prefer that to a swing from A to C. All so right. So you're saying you're saying it, it compresses the range. I'm not sure it does compress the range. I mean, I mean, if you chose uh, alpha, uh, you're, you're swinging from A to B minus, you're swinging from B to choosing from B plus to C. I mean, there's a similar kind of ranges, but it's 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 certainly reasons. Other reasons for choosing. Yeah, the, the guy in blue in here. Uh, yep, yep, here, good. That's right, just don't, don't hold the mic, just let it point at you, it's fine. Uh, well, I guess I thought we could be more collusive and kind of work together, but I guess not. Um, so uh, I chose beta. Is it? There's she a sign in the background, so I missed the answer. Just stand up as soon as we just hear. Sure. Yep, sorry, is it, say again. Sure, my name's Travis. Uh, I thought we could work together, but I guess not. All uh, right, all right, good, good. If you so had chosen you. beta, we would that's all get good pluses, reason. but. Not. Good. So, so Travis is giving us a different reason, right? He's saying, he's saying that maybe, maybe some of you in the room might actually care about each other's grades, right? I mean, you all know each other in class. You all go to the same college. Uh, for example, if we, uh, if we played this game uh, up, in, uh, up in the business school, uh, are there any MBA students here today? One or two, right? We, we played this game up in the business school. I think it's quite likely we're going to get a lot of alphas chosen, right? But if we played this game up in, let's say, the divinity school, <laughs> right? And 
I'm guessing that I'm guessing that Travis's answer is reflecting what you guys are raising here. If you played in the Divinity School, you might think that people in Divinity School might care about other people's grades, right? There might be ethical reasons, perfectly good, sensible ethical reasons for choosing Peter in this game. There might be other reasons as well, but that's that's perhaps the, the reason to focus on. And perhaps the, the lesson I want to draw out of this is that right now, this is not a game. Right now, we have actions, strategies for people to take, and we know what the outcomes are, but we're missing something that will make this a game. What are we missing here? Objectives. We're missing objectives. We're missing payoffs. We're missing what people care about. All right? So we can't really start analyzing a game until we know what people care about, until we know what the payoffs are. And let's, let's just say something now, which I'll probably forget to say at any other, mem any other moment of the class, but today it's relevant. Right? Game theory, me, professors at Yale, cannot tell you what your payoffs should be. They should not, we can't, I can't tell you in a useful way what it is that you should, you know, your goals in life should be or whatever. Right? That's not what game theory is about. However, once we know what your payoffs are, once we know what your goals are, perhaps we can, game theory can help you get there. All right? So we've had two different kind of payoffs mentioned here. We've had the kind of payoff where we care about our own grade, and uh, Travis has mentioned the kind of payoff where you might care about other people's grades. And what we're going to do today is analyze this game under both those possible payoffs. So to start that off, let's put up some possible payoffs for the game. And I promise we'll come back and look at some other payoffs later. We'll, we'll, we'll revisit the Divinity School later. Right. So here, once again, is our same matrix with me and my pair choosing actions alpha and beta. But this time, I'm going to put numbers in here. And some of you will perhaps recognize these numbers, but that's not, not really relevant for now. All right. So what's the idea here? Well, the first idea is that these numbers represent utiles or utilities. Right? They represent what, this, what these people are trying to maximize, what they're trying to achieve, their goals. All right? And the idea, just to, just, to be, just to compare this to the outcome matrix, is for the person who's me here, AC yields a payoff of, uh, so AC is this box, so AC yields a payoff of 3, whereas B minus, B minus yields a payoff of zero, and so on. All right. So what's the interpretation? This is the first interpretation, which kind of the natural interpretation that a lot of you jump to straight away. These are people, people with these payoffs, are people who only care about their own grades. They prefer an A to a B plus, they prefer a B plus to a B minus, and they prefer a B minus to a C. All right, I'm hoping I've got the, the grades in order, otherwise it's gonna ruin my curve at the end of the year. All right, All right. so these people only care about their own grades. only care about their own grades. What do we call people who only care about their own grades? What's a good technical term for them? Right. In England, I think we'd refer to these guys, those technical or not, as uh, evil gits. <laughs> right. these, are not, these are not perhaps the most moral people in the universe. All right. So now we can ask a different question. Suppose, whether these are actually your payoffs or not, pretend they are for now. Right? Suppose these are your payoffs. Now we can ask, not what did you do, but what should you do? Now we have payoffs. I can really switch the question to a normative question. What should you do? And let's come back to, uh, uh, to Cla was it Clara Elise? Where was Clara Elise before? Let's get the mic on you again. So just explain what you did and why again. Why I chose Alpha? Yeah, stand, stand up a second. Okay. That's okay. Right, you, you choose alpha. I'm, I'm assuming these were roughly your payoffs, more or less, right? You were caring about your grades. Yeah, Why did you choose alpha? Um, I'm sorry? Why did you choose alpha? Just, just repeat what you said before, Mike. Because I thought the payoffs, the two um, different payoffs that I could have gotten were highest if I chose alpha. Good, um, good. So what Clarice is saying, it's an important idea, is this, and tell me if I'm paraphrasing you incorrectly, but I think this is more or less what you're saying, is no matter what the other person does, no matter what the pair does, she obtains a higher payoff by choosing alpha. Let's just see that. If the pair chooses alpha, and uh, uh, she chooses alpha, 
then she gets zero. If the pair chooses alpha and she chose beta, she gets minus uh, one. Zero is bigger than minus one. All right? If the pair chooses beta, then if she chooses alpha, she gets three. Beta, she gets one. And three is bigger than one. So in both cases, no matter what the other person does, she receives a higher payoff from choosing alpha, so she should choose alpha. All right? Does everyone follow that, that, that line of reasoning? That's a stronger line of reasoning than the reasoning we had earlier. So the one I've now immediately forgotten the name of in the red shirt, uh, whose name was Courtney. So Courtney also gave a reason for choosing alpha, and it was a perfectly good reason for choosing alpha, nothing wrong with it, but notice that this reason's a stronger reason. It kind of implies your reason. All right? All right? So let's get some definitions down here. I think I can fit it in here. I'll try and fit it in here. Definition. We say that my strategy alpha strictly dominates strictly dominates my strategy beta if my payoff from alpha is strictly greater than that from beta, and this is the key part of the definition, regardless of what others do. Regardless of what others do. So let me just read that back. We say that my strategy alpha strictly dominates my strategy beta. If my payoff from alpha is strictly greater than that from beta, regardless of what others do. Now, it's by no means my main aim in this class to teach you jargon. All right? But a few bits of jargon are going to be helpful in, in allowing the conversation to move forward. And this is certainly one. Evil gets is maybe one too, but this is certainly one. Let's draw out some lessons from this. And actually, so, we, so you can still read that, let me bring down and clean this board. So the first lesson of the class, and there's going to be lots of lessons, is a lesson that emerges immediately from the definition of a, domi a, a, of a dominated strategy. And it's this. So lesson one of the course is do not play a strictly dominated strategy. All right, so I, with apologies to Strunk and White, this is in the passive form, okay? This is dominated, passive voice. Do not play a strictly dominated strategy. Why? Someone want to tell me why? Yeah, Ali, do you want to get this guy? Yeah, yeah. Stand up. Yep. This is right. Yeah. Because, because everyone's going to pick the, sh the dominant outcome, and then everyone's going to get the worst result, the collectively, work I'm not collectively sure that's worst the, result. Uh, yeah, that's a possible answer. I'm looking for something more direct here. So we, we, we look at the definition of a strictly dominated strategy. I'm saying never play one. What's a possible reason for that? Let's, let's, uh, uh, can we get the, the woman there? You always lose? Well, I don't know. This isn't about winning and losing. What else could we have? Can we get this, this guy in the pink down here? Well, the payoffs are lower. The payoffs are lower. OK, so, so here's, a, here's an abbreviated version of that. I mean, that's perhaps a little bit perhaps more abbreviated, slightly like longer. The reason I don't want to play a strictly dominated strategy is, by, is if instead I play the strategy that dominates it, I do better in every case. All right? The reason I never want to play a strictly dominated strategy is if instead I play the strategy that dominates it, whatever uh, anyone else does, I'm doing better than I would have done. All right? Now, that's a pretty convincing argument. That sounds like a convincing argument. It sounds like too obvious even to worth, be worth stating in class. All right? So let me now try and shake your faith a little bit in this, uh, in this answer. All right? As somebody was wanted by the FBI, right? OK. So. How about the following argument? 
look at the payoff matrix again, and suppose I reason as follows. Suppose I reason and say, if we, if we, me and my pair, both reason this way and choose alpha, then we'll both get zero. But if we both reasoned a different way and chose beta, then we'll both get one. So I should choose beta. One's bigger than zero, I should choose beta. What's wrong with that argument? And that argument must be wrong because it goes against the lesson of the class, and the lessons of the class are gospel, right? They're not wrong ever. So what's wrong with that argument? What's wrong with that argument? Yeah, Ali. That's good. Just, 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 yeah, 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 good. Well, because you have to be able to agree, you have to be able to speak to them, but we aren't allowed to show our partners what we wrote. All right, so it involves some notion of agreeing, it involves some notion of agreeing. So certainly part of the problem here with the reasoning I just gave you, the reasoning that said I should choose beta because if we both reason the same way, we both do better that way, involves some kind of magical reasoning. It's as if I'm arguing that if I reason this way and reason myself to choosing beta, somehow I'm going to make the rest of you reason the same way too. It's like I've got ESP or I'm some character out of, uh, uh, what is it called, the X-Men. Is that what it's called, the X-Men, right? Right? Now, in fact, this may come as a surprise to you, I'm not, I don't have ESP and I'm not a character out of the X-Men, and so you can't actually see brainwaves emanating from my head, and my reasoning doesn't affect your reasoning. Right? So if I did reason that way and chose beta, I'm not going to affect your choice one way or the other. Right? That's the first thing that's wrong with that reasoning. What else is wrong with that reasoning? Yeah, that guy down here. Yeah? Well, the second that you choose beta, then someone's going, it's in someone's best interest to take advantage of you. All right, so someone's going to take advantage of me, but even more than that, even stronger argument there. That's true, but even a stronger argument. Well, how about this? Even if I could, even if I was that guy in the X-Men or the Matrix, whatever it was, who could reason his way into making people do things, even if I could make everyone in the room choose beta by the force of my brainwaves, what should I then do? I should choose alpha. If these are my payoffs, I should go ahead and choose alpha, because that way I end up getting three. All right? So it, 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 there's two things wrong with the argument. One, there's this magical reasoning aspect. That I'm, my reasoning is controlling your actions. That doesn't happen in the real world. And two, even if that was the case, I'd do better to myself choose alpha. All right. So nevertheless, there's an element of truth in what I just said. It's, it's the fact that there's an element of truth in it that makes it very, you know, it seems like a good, a, a good argument. The element of truth is this. It is true that by both choosing alpha, we both ended up with B minuses, we both ended up with payoffs of zero, rather than payoffs of one. Right? It is true that by both, choosing, by both following this lesson and not choosing the dominated strategy beta, we ended up with payoffs zero, zero, that were bad. All right? And that's probably the second lesson of the class. So lesson two, and this lesson probably wouldn't be worth stating if it wasn't for sort of a century of thought in economics that said the opposite. So rational choice, in this case, people not choosing a dominated strategy, people choosing a dominant strategy, rational choice can lead to outcomes that, uh, what do Americans call this, that, that suck, that suck, all right? If you want a more technical term for that, and you remember this from, econ uh, from Economics 115, can lead to outcomes that are inefficient, that are Pareto inefficient. But suck will do for today. Right? Rational choice by rational players can lead to bad outcomes. Okay. So this is a famous example for this reason. It's a good illustration of this point. It's a famous example. What's the name of this example, somebody? This is called Prisoner's Dilemma. How many of you have heard of the Prisoner's Dilemma before? It must be story in 115. Why is it called the prisoner's dilemma? Yeah, so the guy here in, in, in orange? Uh, it's okay, it's just, just, it, it can just point at you, it's fine. I think it's whether or not the prisoners cooperate in uh, the, the uh, sentence they have, and if they kind of read out the other person, then they can have less. But if All both right. read out, then they like, end up losing the large scale. Good, good. So in the standard story, you've got these two crooks, or two accused crooks, and they're in separate cells, and they're being interviewed separately, kept apart, and they're both told that if neither of them rats the other guy out, uh, they'll go to jail for, say, a year. If they both rat each other out, they'll end up in jail for two years. But if you rat the other guy out, and he doesn't rat you out, then you'll will go home free, and uh, he'll go to jail for five years. When you put that all down, you pretty quickly see that regardless of whether the other guy rats you out or not, you're better off ratting him out. All right? 
Now, if you haven't ever seen that prisoner's dilemma, uh, you can see it uh, uh, pretty much uh, every night uh, on a show called Law and Order. How many of you have seen Law and Order? Right. If you haven't seen Law and Order, the way to see Law and Order is to go to a random TV set at a random time and turn on a random channel. <laughs> This, this, this happens in every single episode, so much so that if any of you actually, I mean, this might be true at Yale, if any of you, or the TV guys, if any of you know the guy who writes the plots for this, have him come to the class, or I guess see the video now, and we can get some better plot lines in there, right? Yeah. All right. But it's, of course, that's not the only example, the grade game, and this is not the other, only example. There are lots of examples of prisoner's dilemmas out there. Let's try and find some other ones, all right? So how many of you have roommates in your, in your college? How many of you have roommates? Most of you have roommates, right? Right? So uh, I'm guessing now, but I won't make you show your hands because it's probably embarrassing, but what is the state of your dorm rooms, your shared dorm rooms at the end of the semester or the end of the school year? Right? So I'm just guessing, having been in a few of these things over the years, that by the end of the semester, or certainly by the end of the school year, the state of the average Yale dorm room is quite disgusting. <laughs> right? why, is this, why is it disgusting? Why is it disgusting? It's disgusting because people don't tidy up. Right? They don't clean up those bits of pizza and bits of chewed bread and cheese, but why don't they tidy up? Well, let's not just work it out. What would you like to happen if you're sharing a dorm room? You'd like to have the other guy tidy up, right? right? The best thing for you is to have the other guy tidy up, and the worst thing for you is to tidy up for the other guy. But now work it out. It's a prisoner's dilemma. If the other guy doesn't tidy up, you're best off not tidying up either, because the last thing you want is to be tidying up for the other guy. And if the other guy does tidy up, hey, the room's clean. Who cares? Right? So either way, you're not going to tidy up, and you end up with a typical Yale dorm room. Am I being unfair? Are your dorm rooms all perfect? This may be a gender thing, but we're not going to go there. All right? All right? So there are lots of prisoners' dilemmas out there. Anyone got any, any other examples? Other examples? So, I didn't quite hear that. Sorry. Let's try and get a mic on it so we can really hear it. Do, hiring a lawyer and not paying uh, him a lot of money. Oh, and and okay, and divorce, and divorce struggles. Okay, okay, that, that, that's okay. You're too young to be worrying about such things, but never mind. <laughs> never mind. Yeah, okay, that's a good example. Because, all right, hiring lawyers, getting, getting, bringing in big guns. What about an economics example? What about firms who are competing in prices? Right? Both firms have an incentive to undercut the other firm, driving down profits for both. Right? The last thing you want is to have the other firm undercut you in a sense to push prices down. That's good for us, the consumers, but bad for the firm, bad for industry profit. What remedies do we see? We'll, we'll come back to this later on in the class, but let's have a preview. So what remedies do we see in society for prisoners' dilemmas? What kind of remedies do we see? Let me try and get, uh, get the, the guy here and right, right in front of uh, you. Yeah. Collusion. Yeah, go ahead. Collusion. Collusion. Okay, so firms could collude. All right. So uh, what, what prevents them from colluding? What prevents them from colluding? So one thing they could do, presumably, is they could write a contract, these firms. They could say, I won't lower my prices if you don't lower your prices. And they could put this contract in with the pricey lawyer who's taking his day off from the divorce court. And that would secure that they wouldn't uh, lower it prices on each other. Is that right? right? So why wouldn't that work? Why wouldn't writing a contract here work? Right, it's against the law, right? It's an illegal contract. It's an illegal contract, all right? What about you with your roommate? How many of you have a, have a written contract on, you know, stuck with a magnet on the fridge telling you you're supposed to, when you're supposed to tidy up? Very few of you, right? Why, why do you manage to get some cooperation between you and your roommates even without a, even without a written contract? It's not legally enforceable. Well, it probably is legally enforceable, actually. This guy says it's not. It probably is legally enforceable. You probably could have a written contract about tidying up. Yeah, the, 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 the woman in, the, in here, yeah. You do it over and over? Yeah, so maybe, maybe even uh, among your roommates, maybe you don't need a contract because you can manage to achieve the same end by the fact that you're going to be interacting with the same person over and over again during a time at Yale. So we'll come back and revisit the idea that repeating an interaction may, may uh, allow you to attain cooperation, but we're not going to come back to that till after the midterm. That's way down the road, but we'll get there. All right? Now, one person earlier on had mentioned something about communication. I think it was somebody in the front, right? So let's just think about this a second. Is communication the problem here? Is the, is the reason people behave badly in this, or badly, people choose alpha in this game here, is it the fact that they can't communicate? Suppose, suppose, you, suppose you'd be able to talk beforehand. So suppose uh, the woman here whose name was Mary. Mary had been able to talk to the person next to her whose name is 
Erica, and they'd said, you know, suppose we know we're going to be paired together. I'll choose beta if you choose beta. Would that work? Why wouldn't that work? So yeah. There's, there's no enforcement. There's no enforcement, all right? So it isn't a failure of communication per se, right? A contract is more than communication. A contract is communication with teeth, right? It actually changes the payoffs. So I, I could communicate with Ally some agreements, but back home, I'm going to go and go ahead and choose alpha anyway. All the better if he's choosing beta. All right, so we'll come back and talk about more of these things as the course goes on, but I'll just come back to the to two we forgot there. So the collusion case and the case back in law and order with the, with the prisoners and the cell. How do they enforce their contracts? And they don't always rat each other out, and some firms manage to collude. How do they manage to enforce those contracts? Those agreements, how are they enforced? Yeah, they trust each other. It could be they trust each other, although if you trust a crook, that's not a, you know, what, what else could it be? Yeah, the, guy, the guy here again with the beard, yeah? Is there some game? Well, but this is the game, right? So here's yeah. the game. So we'll no, but the, pay, the way they value, the, the right. way of okay, valuing good, good. each decision. So the payoffs may be different. The payoffs may be different. I have something simpler in mind. How, suppose they have a written contract, or even an unwritten contract. What enforces the contract for colluding firms or crooks in jail? Uh, in five years, when the other guy gets out, he might run into a situation. Yeah, or, uh, yeah. So a short version of that is, it's a different kind of contract. If you rat someone out in jail, someone puts a contract out on you. All right? All right? Tony Soprano enforces those contracts. That's the purpose of Tony Soprano. It's the purpose of the mafia. The reason the mafia thrives in countries where it's hard to write legal contracts, let's say some new, some new parts of the former Soviet Union or some parts of Africa, the reason the mafia thrives in those environments is that it substitutes for the law and enforces both legal and illegal contracts. All right, so I promised a while ago now that we were going to come back and look at this game under some other possible payoffs. So let, no, I, I wasn't under a contract, but let's come back and fulfill that promise anyway. So we're going to revisit, if not the divinity school, at least some people who have more morality than my friends up in the business school. And we're going to ask for the same grade game we played at the, at the beginning, what would happen if players' payoffs look different? So these are possible payoffs too, all right? And I'll give these a name. We called the other guys evil gets. So we'll, give, we'll call these guys indignant angels. I can never spell indignant. Is that roughly right? Does that look right? I think it's right. Indignant, isn't it? Indignant. All right, indignant angels. And we'll see why in a second. So here are their payoffs. And once again, the basic structure of the game hasn't changed. It's still, I'm choosing alpha and beta. My pair is choosing alpha and beta. And the grades are the same as they were before. They're, they're hidden by that board, but you saw them before. All right? But this time, the payoffs are as follows. On the lead diagonal, we still have 0, 0, and 1, 1. But now the grades here are minus 1 and minus, so the, sorry, the payoffs are minus 1 and minus 3. And here, they're minus 3 and minus 1. And what's the idea here? These aren't the only other possible payoffs, it's just an idea. Suppose I get an A and my pair gets a C, then, sure, I get that initial payoff of three, but unfortunately, I can't sleep at night because I'm feeling so guilty. Right? I, have some, I have some kind of moral conscience, and after I've subtracted off my guilt feelings, I end up at minus one. So think of this as guilt, some notion of morality. All right? How, conversely, if I chose a beta and my pair chose an alpha, so I end up with a C and she ends up with an A, then you know, I have a bad time explaining to my parents why I got a C in this class, and I have to say about how I'm going to be president anyway. But then in addition, I feel indignation against this person. It isn't just that I got a C. I got a C because she made me get a C. Right? So that moral indignation takes us down to minus three. Right, so again, I'm not, I'm not claiming these are the only other possible payoffs, but just another possible to look at. Okay. So suppose these were the payoffs in the game. Right, again, suspend disbelief a second and imagine that these actually are your payoffs. And let me ask you what you would have done in this case. So think about it a second. Right, now write it down. Write down what you're going to do on the corner of your notepad. Just write down at alpha or beta what you're going to do here. 
They're not all writing. The guy in the England shirt isn't writing. You've got to be writing if you're in an England shirt. Show it to your neighbor. Let's have a show of hands. Again, I want you to keep your hands up so that uh, Jude can see it now. So how many of you chose alpha in this case? Raise your hands. Don't want to be shy. Raise your hands. How many chose beta in this case? How many people abstained? Not allowed to abstain. Let's try it again. Alpha, alpha in this case, no abstentions here. Beta in this case. So we're roughly splitting the room. Roughly splitting the room. Uh, someone who chose alpha. Can I raise the alphas again? Uh, let me get this guy here. Uh, Ali, can we get this guy here? So wh why did you choose alpha? Oh, uh, you would minimize your losses. You'd get zero or negative one instead of negative three or one. All right. So, so this gentleman's saying. Dominant strategy. So. Right. So this, this gentleman's saying a good reason for choosing alpha in this game is it's it's less risky. Right. The worst case scenario is less bad. That's what I'm saying it. All right. What about somebody who shows beta? A lot of you shows beta. Let's, let's have a show of hands on the betas again. Let me see the betas again. So uh, again, raise your hands, raise your hands. Can we get, yeah, can we get the woman here? Uh, can, can we ask her why she chose beta? Um, because if you chose alpha, the best case scenario is you get zero. Good, so okay, so, so that's, a, that's a good counter argument. So the gentleman here was looking at the worst case scenario and the woman here was looking at the best case scenario. And the best case scenario here looks like uh, getting a one here. All right. Now let's ask a different question. Is one of the strategies dominated in this game? No, neither strategy is dominated. Let's just check. If my pair chooses alpha, then my choosing alpha yields zero, beta minus three, so alpha would be better. But if my pair chooses beta, then alpha yields minus one, beta yields one. In this case, beta would be better. Right? So alpha in this case is better against alpha, and beta is better against beta, but neither dominates each other. All right? So here's a game where it's we just changed the payoffs. We had the same basic structure, the same outcomes, but we imagined people cared about different things, and we end up with a very different answer. In the first game, it was kind of clear that we should choose alpha, and here it's not at all clear what we can do, what we should do. Right? In fact, this kind of game has a name, and we'll revisit it later on this semester. This kind of game is called a coordination problem. And we'll talk about coordination problems later on. But the main lesson I want to get out of this for today is a simpler lesson. It's the lesson that payoffs matter. Right? We change the payoffs, we change what people cared about, and we get a very different game with a very different outcome. All right? So there's a, the basic lesson is that payoffs matter, but let me say it a different way. So without giving away my age too much, well, I guess it will actually, uh, when I was a kid growing up in England, there was this guy, uh, there's a, there was a pop star, and slightly post-punk pop star, called Joe Jackson, who none of you will have heard of because you're all about 10 years old. It's not my fault. And Joe Jackson had this song in which had the lyric, uh, something like, you can't get what you want unless you know what you want. Right? You, can't get you, you can't get what you want unless you know what you want. And as a statement of logic, that's false. Right? It could be that what you want just drops into your lap without you knowing about it. All right? But as a statement of strategy, it's a pretty good idea. It's a good idea to try and figure out what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve, before you uh, go ahead and analyze the game. All right? So payoffs matter. Well, let's put it in his version. You can't get what you want till you know what you want. Be honest, how many of you have heard of Joe Jackson? Oh, it makes me feel old. Oh, man. OK. It goes down every year. All right. So, so far, we've looked at this game as played by people who are evil kids. And we've looked at this game as played by people who are indignant angels. But we can do something more interesting. We can imagine playing this game on a sort of mix and match. For example, imagine, this shouldn't be hard for most of you, imagine that you are an evil git, but you know that the person you're playing against is an indignant angel. Right, let's say again. Imagine that you know you're an evil git, but you know that the person you're playing against or with is an indignant angel. What should you do in that case? What should you do in that case? Who thinks you should choose alpha in that case? Let's have pan the room again, if we can. 
Keep your hands up so, so you, that you can see. All right. Who thinks, you choose, uh, who thinks you choose beta in that case? Who's abstaining here? Not allowed to abstain in this class. It's a complete no-no. Okay, so we'll allow some abstention on the first day, but not beyond today. Let's have a look. Let's analyze this combined game. All right. So what does this game look like? It's an evil get versus an indignant angel. All right, and it, we can put the payoff matrix together by combining the matrices we had before. So in this case, this is me, as always. This is my pair, the column player. Okay, my payoffs are going to be what? Uh, my payoffs are going to be the evil get payoffs. So they come from the matrix up there. So if I'm going to help me by reading it off there, that's a 0, a 3, a minus 1, and a 1. All right? My opponent or my partner's payoffs come from the indignant angel ma uh, matrix. So they come from here. They're a 0, a minus 3, a minus 1, and a 1. Everyone see how I constructed that? So I'll just remind you again, the first payoff is the row player's payoff, in this case the evil get. And the second payoff is the column player's payoff, in this case the indignant angel. All right, well now we've set it up as a matrix, let's try again that question I asked before. Suppose you're the row player here, so you're the evil get, those are your payoffs, you're playing against an indignant angel, what would you do? All right? So once again, no, no abstention this time. Who would choose alpha? Let's have a show of hands again. Keep your hands up a second. And who would choose beta? Right, very few betas, but mostly alpha. Alpha, I think, is the right answer here, but why? Why? Why is alpha the right answer here? So, yeah, can, can we get this guy here? Yeah. It's the dominant strategy. Good, good. Actually, nothing has changed from the game we started with. The fact I changed the other guy's payoffs didn't matter here. Alpha was dominant before. It dominated beta before. And it still dominates beta. Let's just check. If my opponent chooses alpha, and I choose alpha, I get 0. Beta, I get minus 1, so alpha would be better. If my opponent chooses beta, and I choose alpha, I get 3. Beta, I get 1. Once again, alpha is better. So as before, alpha does better than beta for me, regardless of what the other person does. Alpha dominates beta. What was the first lesson of the class? What was the first lesson of the class? Shouting out, please. Right, right, so you should all have been choosing in this game. You all should be choosing the, you, all, you all should have chosen alpha, right? So the one person who didn't will let him off for today, okay? Okay, so alpha dominates beta here. All right, let's flip things around. All right, suppose now, harder to imagine, but let's try it. Suppose now that you are an indignant angel and you're playing against, and you know this, you're playing against an evil get. Okay. You're an indignant angel, so you have the payoffs that are still there, and you're playing against an evil get, which is the payoffs we covered up, but we'll reproduce them. Let's produce that matrix. By the way, this is going to sound like a, a wrestling match. I don't mean it to. Let's try here. Alpha, beta, alpha, beta, pair, me. All right, so my payoffs this time are the indignant angel payoffs. So mine are 0, minus 1, minus 3, and 1. And my opponent's payoffs are, what would have been my payoffs before? The, they come from the other matrix. Let's just show you it. They come from this matrix. So they're going to be 0, minus 1, 3, 1. 0, minus 1, 3, 1. OK, I took the, I took the second payoff from that matrix and made it the second payoff in this matrix. OK, everyone see how I did that? Once again, the row player is the first payoff, and the column player is the other payoff. All right, what should you do in this case? You're the indignant angel. You're playing against this evil get. What should you do? Write down in your notepad pad what you should do. Show it to your neighbor so you can't cheat. Well, you can cheat, but you'll be shamed, shamed in front of your neighbor. And uh, Raise your hands, or let, let, let Jude see it. Raise your hands and keep them up uh, if you chose alpha now. And how about if you chose beta now? 
but one or two betas, mostly alphas. Well, let's see, let's, let's reason this through a second. Does alpha, does my alpha dominate my beta? No, in fact, alpha doesn't dominate beta for me. Doesn't dominate beta. If my, if, if my pair chooses alpha, then alpha gets me zero, beta minus three, so alpha does better. But if my pair chooses beta, then alpha gets me minus one, beta gets me one. In this case, beta is better. better. So once again, as we saw before, alpha is better against alpha, beta is get better against beta. There's no dominance going on here. Nevertheless, at least 90% of you chose alpha here. And that's the right answer. Why? Why should you choose alpha here? Uh, somebody, can we, can we get the guy with the, with the beard here? Yeah, uh, wait, wait for the mic. There you go, great. We've acknowledged that alpha is a dominant strategy for my opponent, so we must choose based upon or knowing that my opponent's going to choose alpha. Good, good. Uh, good. And your name is? Henry. Henry. So Henry's saying, sure, I don't have a dominated strategy. My alpha doesn't dominate my beta. But look at my opponent. My opponent's alpha dominates her beta. If I choose alpha, and she chooses alpha, she gets zero. Beta, she gets minus one. Alpha is better. If I choose beta, if she chooses alpha, she gets three. Beta one. Again, again alpha is better. For my opponent, alpha dominates beta. So by, by thinking about my opponent, by putting myself in my uh, opponent's shoes, I realize that she has a dominant strategy, alpha. She's going to choose alpha. And my best response against alpha is to choose alpha myself. All right, so here, this time, my alpha does not dominate beta, but my pairs, my pairs' choice of alpha dominates her choice her possible choice of beta. So she will choose, so she will choose alpha, and once I know that she's gonna choose alpha, it's clear that I should choose alpha and get zero rather than beta and get minus three. So I should choose alpha also. All right. Okay, so now we've seen four different combinations. We've seen a case where an evil git was playing an evil git, where an indignant angel was playing an indignant angel, and we've seen both the flips of those, the evil git versus the indignant angel, and the indignant angel against the evil git. Why are we doing this? Because there's an important lesson here. What's the lesson here? The lesson is, comes from this game, that a great way to analyze game, a great way to get used to the idea of strategic thinking, perhaps even the essence of strategic thinking, is the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes figure out what their payoffs are, and try and figure out what they're going to do. All right, so the big lesson of this game is, I forgot what number we're up to, I guess this is lesson four, I think. Lesson four is, put yourself in others' shoes and try to figure out what they will do. And in a sense, this is the first difficult lesson of the class. It's easy to spot when a strategy is dominant, more or less. It's pretty easy to, to figure out you have to know about your own payoffs. But the hard thing in life is getting you to come out of your own selves a bit Realizing it's, quote, not all about you, you've got to put yourself in other people's shoes to figure out what they care about and what they're going to try and do so you can respond well to that. All right. Now, while we're here, let's just mention that things will get more complicated in a world where I don't actually know the payoffs of my opponent. It's much easier to figure out my own payoffs than to figure out my opponent's payoffs. Right? I might not know whether I'm playing someone who's an evil git or an indignant angel, so I'm going to have to figure out what the odds are of that in doing this exercise. And that gets, that's, we're going to come back to that idea too way at the end of the class. Right? That's getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but we'll get there. All right. Now it turns out that this game, this prisoner's dilemma with the alphas and betas, or essentially the same game, has been played many, many, many times in experiments. All right? So out there in the real world, I think we can do this here, out there in the real world, when they do these experiments, 
they find out that roughly 70% of people choose alpha, and roughly 30% choose beta. Roughly, uh, you know, almost a third choose beta. Now, what do we think is going on? Why are so, you know, that's, a, that's a third of the pe people who seem to be choosing a dominated strategy, or, or is it? What's going on there? Why, why do you think, why do you think 30% of people are choosing, are choosing beta? Anybody? Yeah, who, can, can we catch this guy here? Well, they, they might be motivated by the fact that every, every person who chooses beta raises the, the average right, score. Right, so they, they could be on. moral people. They could be, so one possibility is this 30% of people in the real world who choose beta are just nice people. All right, what else could it be? I know this might be changing the game a little bit, but if you ever expected to play the same game with the partner, all right, so they could, be, they, they could be thinking they're going to play yeah, again. They could long be, run payoffs are greater if you choose beta every all time. Right. So yeah. they could be that they think this is actually you know, they, they, they haven't understood the experiment and they think this is a multi-shot game, not a one-shot game. Good. What else could it be? And that's, that's, that's a, what's the simplest explanation? What's the other obvious explanation? They could just be stupid, right? It could be, right? Right? We're allowed to say that in class, right? 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 Let's be honest here. When we say experiments in the real world in game theory, or the ones you read about in the New York Times, the real world, when it comes to experiments uh, on, in economics, really means undergraduates at the University of Arizona, right? That's why all these. They all, I mean, I'm not making that up. It, it just does. They all are. And and I don't know anything about it. any of you from Arizona. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether the average undergraduate at the University of Arizona just has a sunny personality, or whether they spent too long in the sun. I just don't know which it is, right? <laughs> right? We can't really distinguish from this, right? How about at Yale? What, uh, what's our numbers here? How about in this class? Do you want, do you want to mic your, your colleague here? Yeah. Two thirty-eight. So two thirty-eight at Yale. This is Yale versus thirty-six. So even, even at my level of arithmetic, that's a lot less than 30%, right? That's more like, it's less than 15%. No, it's about 15%, I guess. All right? All right, so 236, no, sorry, 238 shows alpha, and 36 shows beta. Now, there's, a, there's one more lesson in this class, and this is going to be it. This, is going to be a lot, this isn't the end of the class, but one more lesson to take home. You guys are going to be playing games among each other today and until whatever it is, December 7th, whatever it is, the end of, the end of, uh, the end of term. All right, so look around each other. You better get to know each other a bit. All right, and what have we learned today about you guys? The lesson here, lesson five, is Yale students are evil. <laughs> All right, be aware of that when you're playing games. All right, I want to play one more game today. Uh, in the remaining minutes. It doesn't matter if we finish a little bit early, but I want to try and get the, this game at least started. So do you all have game number two in front of you? Well, just while you're really reading that over, can I also make sure you've all got your legal forms and you, you're going to sign? Don't walk away with your legal forms. We need to get those collected in. So, gonna, so at the end of talking about this game, I'm going to collect in both the second game for the class and also the legal form. Right? If you don't have a legal form, if you've lost it or something, it's online. All right? It's online. All right? Let's have a look at that second game. I'll read it out for you. Game two, pick a number. Everyone got this? Anyone not got this? Everyone got it? Good. Without showing your neighbor what you're doing, put in the box below a whole number between 1 and 100. Whole number between 1 and 100, integer. We will calculate the average number chosen in the class. The winner in this game is the person whose number is closest to two-thirds times the average in the class. Again, the winner is the person whose number is closest to two-thirds times the average number in the class. And the winner will win $5 minus the difference in pennies between her choice and that two-thirds of the average. Now, just to make sure you've understood this, let me do an example on the board. One more board, that's good. So imagine there were three people in the class, and imagine that they chose 25, 5, and 60. All right, so 25 plus 5 plus 60 is 90. 
people should feel free to correct my arithmetic because it's often wrong. 90, right? And 90, uh, two thirds of 90, so two thirds of 90, two thirds of, uh, uh, whoops, whoops, uh, what do I need? Start again. Start again. I need to divide it by three to get the average, right? So the average, the average is 30. Thank you, somebody, is that what you're shouting at? Right, so the total is 90, the average is 30, am I right so far? All right, so two thirds of the average, two thirds of the average is 20. I'm looking desperately at the TA, is that right? Whew, okay, all right, so the average is 30 and two thirds of the average is 20. All right, so who's the winner here? Which, which number would have, would have won here? 25 would have won, 25 would have been the closest, and what would they have won? They'd have won five bucks minus five cents for a total of 4.95. All right. Now to make this interesting, let's play this for real. So this, of course, relies on me having brought some money and being able to do this without dislodging the microphone. All right. So I'm going to see if I have. Sorry about that. I'm going to see if I have enough money to do this class for real. When we play this game. In the, uh, in the old days, you know, during the dot-com boom with the MBA students, you had to put 50 bucks on the table to get them interested. <laughs> graduate students, five cents will do it. <laughs> okay, so this is a, there's some bloke with a beard on this one. Yeah, this is a, okay, this is Lincoln apparently. Lincoln apparently, who knew? Lincoln, okay. All right, so this is a $5 note, and I'm gonna put it, sorry about that again. I'm gonna put it in uh, an envelope. I'm not cheating anybody, right? I'm not, no, no magic tricks here. And uh, this is going to be the prize for this, for this game. And we better give this to someone we trust. All right, so prize for 159. Who do you guys trust? The camera guy. Okay, Jude. <laughs> we know Jude's going to be there next week. All right, I'm giving it to Jude. You can't see this on camera, people at home, but I'm giving it to Jude, okay? I'm going to put it here. And Jude has to therefore show up next week with the prize, okay? All right? I thought we should give it to the guy at the back who was the moral guy. Who was our moral guy at the back? What is it? All right, well, never mind. We'll give, it, we'll give it to Jude. We know Jude's going to be here. All right. Has everyone put a number down? Any questions? Yeah, questions? Yes. Just shout them out to me. Given that we only have one $5 bill, does there have to be one unique winner? And if so, how is that determined if we have multiple people who are closest? Well, we'll, we'll, that's a good question. If there's multiple winners, we'll divide it, but we'll make sure everyone has a positive winning, okay? Right, good question. Uh, given the number of people in the room, there may be multiple winners. I accept that, accept that possibility. Has everyone written down a number now? All right, so hand your numbers to the end of the row, but don't go yet. Hand your numbers to the end of the row. Before you go, I want five things from you. All right, I want to know the five lessons from this class. All right, tell, it, tell me what you learned. What were the five lessons? Without looking at your notes, what were the five lessons? Anybody? What? Shout out one of the lessons. Yes, madam. Don't play a strictly dominated strategy. Anything else? Anything else? Yes, sir. Yale students are evil. Two lessons down, three to go. The, the guy over here, yep. Rational, choice can lead, rational choices can lead to bad outcomes. We put it more graphically before, but that's fine. Two more outcomes. Two more. Put yourself in other people's shoes, and I'm missing one. I can't remember what I'm missing now. Ah, you can't get what you want, you, you could, but it's a good idea to figure out what you want before you try and get what you want. Five things you learned today, hand in your numbers and the legal forms, and I'll see you on Monday.